meeting, um, but I'd like to thank everybody for coming along and joining us this evening. Um, welcome on behalf of the Forest Hill Society to 20th century history of Forest Hill. Um, we've got a few panelists who can talk a little bit about the history of Forest Hill with a wealth of experience, but we also recognize that everybody has stories uh, from the 20th century of Forest Hill, unless you're under 20 or recently moved here. Um, you'll, you'll have had your own experience of Forest Hill. So um, I'm Michael Abrahams. I've been the chair of Forest Hill Society previously. The current chair is Klaus, who's also on, on, on the call. Um, uh, I've been in Forest Hill since uh, 1979, when I was four years old, um, and uh, lived around various parts of Forest Hill, but uh, that's more than you need to know about me. Uh, I want to introduce to you some of our guest speakers, our panelists for this evening. Uh, I, before I do, uh, I just want to say, this meeting is being recorded. You're most welcome to contribute, to come off mute and to speak uh, at any time you want. We haven't uh, forced everybody to be silent. Uh, we will if too many people start speaking at once, um, but we hope that we can just have a good uh, uh, discussion. If there is something that you want to bring up, please add it to the chat. I'll probably mention that again in a minute. So. Without further ado, let, let's get started. We've got 68 people, which is a fantastic start to the meeting. Um, but there's three people I particularly want to mention who are our panel for this evening. Um, Pip Wedge uh, is joining us from Canada. Uh, he lived in Forest Hill from 1928 until 1954. Uh, that includes a lot of the Second World War. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the bombing of Forest Hill Station. Uh, and uh, and uh, as, I, as the screen says, he moved to Canada in 1965. Um, also uh, on our panel this evening is uh, Angela Finch, uh, part of the Finch family who've been trading in Forest Hill since 1947. Uh, not Angela, I should say. She hasn't been uh, in Forest okay. Hill or trading in, as, as Finch's all this time. It's a multi-generational business uh, and it's a pleasure to have Angela joining us this evening to talk a little bit about Finches, about Perry Vale uh, and, and about uh, shops uh, and other things in Forest Hill. Um, our final guest this evening is John, who moved to Forest Hill in 1949 when he was two years old. Um, he's lived in a variety of streets uh, around Forest Hill um, and uh, remembers a lot of the old shops, remembers some concerts in the Glenlyn Ballroom uh, on Perry Vale, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, and, and also the good old steam trains, uh, which are way before my time and uh, just incredible to think, <laughs> somehow it's incredible to think of steam trains going through Forest Hill Station. Um, so that's our panel for, uh, to get us started on the history of Forest Hill, um, but we do welcome your contributions as well. Um, and that's why I've sort of said the fourth panelist is you. Uh, your contributions are really welcome. Uh, you're welcome to add things to the chat, uh, to tempt us to uh, bring you into the discussion uh, and uh, to share your uh, memories of Forest Hill as well. We really would like to hear from as many people as possible. Uh, and we're recording this. It, it definitely should be noted that we're recording this. Uh, so if you are saying anything uh, uh, and switching on your, uh, and, and we switch over to your video, then uh, you will be recorded. Uh, we welcome your contributions though, uh, uh, if, if you would like to share. I think in some ways this becomes a historical document uh, in its own right. So many people may choose to write books about local history. We're doing a Zoom about local history. And honestly, it becomes uh, a, a document in its own right. Uh, our previous meeting, uh, our previous history talk back in October has now had over 700 views on, uh, on the channel, on, on YouTube, on Facebook and things like that. Uh, and it shows how popular uh, local history is. So please do contribute uh, in whatever way you would like to. So now I'm going to uh, try to stop sharing uh, and I'm going to uh, hopefully uh, highlight Pip, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, his time in Forest Hill. Uh, and Pip, if we can just uh, start um, with, with an introduction from you uh, and talk maybe a little bit about uh, what Forest Hill was like and some of your earliest memories of Forest Hill. 
Okay, um, <clears throat> I was born in Manor Mount, which runs down into Davids Road, which comes out right by Forest Hill Station. And uh, I first went to, to a kindergarten down Stansted Road at St. Cuthbert's College, which was a, a girls' school with a kindergarten half day. And I went there for, for several years until I was uh, eight. And then I went to Adams Road School in Lower Sydenham, capturing the 78 bus from Baldrum Crescent there, uh, and coming home for lunch incidentally every day being able to get there because the traffic was minimal and buses could get you there and back in no time at all. Uh, so um, I was, went to Adams Road from 33 to 38 and then went to Rhone School for a year, um, which uh, was in Greenwich. I got a scholarship there and that involved going down from Manor Mount along David's Road, ducking into Havelock Walk, which I now see is a remarkably respectable place, but. When I walked down have a lot work walk in those days, uh, the, the, the overriding thing was the smell from the slaughterhouse. Chalk and Cox uh, uh, butchers at the station had their slaughterhouse down have a lot. And so the herds of sheep would be seen being herded down there by people rather than dogs, but, uh, and they were dispensed, disposed of at the end. <laughs> And that was what Havelock really was, and didn't get the uh, the detriment from the, from the uh, from the, the sheep removed as often as it ought to have been. Anyway, out of Havelock, walk onto London Road opposite the Capitol, where I taught the tram, a fifty-eight or a sixty-two to uh, Lewisham Library, then a fifty-four bus that took me up and across Blackheath to Roman School at Greenwich, and I did that for a year until nineteen thirty-nine. I left uh, in 1939, I was evacuated with Roan to Tice first in Kent and then to uh, Rye in Sussex. But I came back in May 1940 because they wouldn't let us come home because it was Whitson and uh, Hitler invaded Holland and Belgium and they were afraid we might get bombed in London. So they said, you can't come home or well, you might lose your billet. So I called my mom and said, mom, they won't let me come home. And uh, she said, well, do you want to come home? And I said, yeah. She said, well, they're all going to die. We might as well die together. So I did come home and we didn't. Um, so I was in London all through the war. Uh, and uh, having arrived back in, in the May um, of, of 1940, um, it wasn't long before we started getting the Battle of Britain. And then I went to uh, what was Allen's School in Dulwich became the South. South London Emergency School. So I would every morning go down to the Capital Cinema going the other direction this time, get a 58 or a 62 to Townley Road at Dulwich and walk along to SLES as it was called for short, South London Emergency Secondary School. Had my education there through, through 1944. Uh, General Schools was in June of 44 during Doodle Bugs, of which a bit more later. And um, they closed the school except for those of us doing, uh, doing general schools. So uh, we were had discipline whereby we had to get under the desks when doodlebugs came over, which they did from time to time. And we tried to learn all kinds of French words for bombs and doodlebugs and things for our oral French, but didn't need them, fortunately. Um, and uh, so I finished school in, uh, in June of 44. And... Uh, worked in an advertising agency until I joined the Navy in 46. So I was in London all through the war and um, I was in the civil defense service as a messenger with a small tin hat and a large back when you were riding your bicycle around with uh, shrapnel falling from anti-aircraft guns going off overhead. And uh, one of my joyous jobs was to go into the shelters and ask them how many people there were there, how many men, women or children, uh, because we want, wanted to know how many to dig for if there was a direct hit. Um, Forest Hill was um, a, a very friendly place. It certainly has not, I didn't have at the time, a Forest Hill society. I guess we were too, all too busy looking after ourselves. There was a camaraderie among everybody because you were sharing the same experience, rather like we are with COVID-19 today. Um, 
And certainly there was a camaraderie among the, the shopkeepers. My father ran a tobacco store, a just school's tobacconist office at school, and he knew the chap who were trailings, the fishmongers, and the people at Chalk and Cox and Ginns and, and uh, Sainsbury's and so on. So it was quite a matey community. Um, uh, and if anybody, uh, I might just talk for a moment, uh, Michael and I talked about this. I was there, in fact, my father and I and my uncle were standing out in our garden watching doodlebugs, uh, V1 bombs coming over. There was a, several direct lines that they followed coming out of where, wherever it was, Balloon or whatever it might have been. And uh, we would watch the doodlebugs coming straight overhead and we'd pray that they keep going and somebody else would get it. Uh, but there was this one particular one that stopped uh, just before it got to us and we had no idea where it was going to land. Sometimes they came straight down, sometimes they did a complete circle went, and before dropping. This one landed on Forest Hill Station. Uh, it landed on where the subway was and then unfortunately it was a Sunday and at Forest Hill Station, the central platform, which you can see uh, you just saw just now, the central platform was um, only used on a Sunday. There was a fast train that went from London Bridge to East Croydon uh, and stopped in Forest Hill on the way. And unfortunately, uh, on that um, platform were, were, more, were some people where normally there would have been nobody. As a result, I think three people were killed and 10 were severely injured. It wasn't, I was attached to a warden's post, which was near where we lived, but it wasn't, didn't cover that area, but it was only just across the border from where we were responsible for. So I went down and helped and carried a couple of stretchers with, uh, with I don't know, alive or dead, but they were bought. People I helped carry down to ambulances, which are a little further down, down Waldron Crescent. And uh, that was, of course, the major event that was the closest one to us. There was another V1 on Ulm Road behind us um, a little later on. But um, uh, otherwise, uh, we endured the war. We uh, did, went to school and got, got under the desks when air raids happened. And um, it's, we were lucky to get through it. Uh, people, if you look at the where the bombs fell, it was totally arbitrary. On the matter of Forest Hill Station, it had been suggested, as I recall, that um, um, if the station was deliberately targeted, there can be no question of that. The V1s were not aimable to any one spot. They got a fair idea where they were going and uh, they came and dropped all over London. And they inevitably with the number of them that hit London, uh, several had to hit railway stations or railways one place or another. So it was purely for, by chance that Forest Hill Station was hit. I think I've stopped. Okay, that enough to be going on with? Pip, thank you very much for, for that. And, uh, you know, I, I think hopefully I'm sharing my screen at the moment and we're looking at a bomb damage map of Forest Hill. Is, yes, is, is, that, is that on screen? Yes. Yes, so, still is on the so, screen down at the bottom there. That's it. Yeah. So I believe the circles are V1s or V2s where they've hit, but there's a lot of other bomb damage in the area that you can see. So particularly around the station, whether deliberate or not. Um, but a lot of this would have been caused not by the V1s or V2s, but by aerial bombing. Um, and you can see that uh, a lot of the shops around uh, the the station area were bombed, including pubs that were on uh, the site uh, that later became. Uh, Finch's yard and uh, is now City Walk, um, but you can see that the um, very bad damage is in black and purple uh, and then uh, red and orange for lighter damage. Uh, this is Perry Street, uh, now a block of flats, but previously it was uh, another set of um, shops, uh, another high street uh, uh, entrance to Forest Hill. Um, so, so we can see that. And uh, just going back to some of the uh, images that Pip was referring to on the bomb damage of Forest Hill, um, um, where uh, people were 
seriously injured. Um, but you can also see the damage to the building itself from these uh, newspaper uh, photos. Uh, this is looking from the southbound platform across basically through what was the station building. Uh, and uh, you can see Barclays Bank on the corner of London Road. Um, uh, you know, a, a remarkable view that just doesn't exist today. Um, you can also see the station building with the clock tower in the background uh, here, um, showing uh, some significant damage. Um, we've got some other pictures of the clock tower. So it used to look uh, something like this uh, with the horses and carts going past. Um, the, the Aberdeen house here, um, which I think is the butcher's now, or was the butcher's and now is a big uh, uh, betting shop. Uh, we've got the corner here uh, where the uh, where the laundrette used to be and is now, I think, Pedder. Um, and uh, we, we can see the clock tower uh, there. Uh, a little later uh, after the war, we can see the clock tower. Uh, sorry. Um, so we can see the clock tower with, without the top on it without the clock in it. Um, but you can also see WH Smiths and some other uh, parts of the station uh, area there. Uh, Michael, and... I've got a question for Pitt, if I may. Um, so on that map that you showed, there's still, I mean, it might be a bit of a biased question, but on Waldenshaw Road, there's that giant church, St. Paul's was still on the map there. And Pip said he grew up on Manor Mount. I was wondering if he was still there during the war on Manor Mount, and if he remembers the church, or if he even heard the. the not bank. only, not only class did I remember the church. I sang in the choir <gasps> briefly for about one month. I think I got two two shillings and sixpence. My sister was uh, in the choir. She nearly married one of the older choir boys, but I'm glad she didn't. Um, but um, no, I have the church was there, and. Uh, in fact, the church uh, during the war, um, that church, St. Paul's, plus five others, St. John's in Devonshire Road, the Sydenham Baptist Church in Dartmouth Road, the Methodist Church further up Dartmouth Road, the church in the Grove uh, on Jews Walk, and uh, the Holy Trinity Church, all six of them formed a youth club called the Fawcett Youth Centre. And we used to have dancing lessons and physical training instruction in the church hall at, uh, at uh, St. Paul's. And we had various different activities, including the first aid at Church in the Grove, Jews Walk, um, uh, around, around the area. Uh, so I'm very familiar with St. Paul's. And just while I finish off on, on this youth center, they eventually bought a shop in Dartmouth Road, I think it was 20 Dartmouth Road, on the right hand side going north, where the roads, where the shops sort of set back, start setting back, uh, as you get north of where the post office, I think, used to be. Anyway, they bought a shop and the, build, the, the whole building, and that became the Fawcett Youth Center from, oh, I think about 1943 uh, through to, oh, I don't know, 1950, 51, I think. But yes, I did know the balls. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I mean, th there's two big things in Forest Hill that, that uh, or, or around Forest Hill. I mean, you, you would have been alive when the Crystal Palace was still there. I know that we've talked about it briefly pr previously, and I know that you have visited it, um, but you also remember it burning down, if I remember correctly. Yes, yeah. Yes, I had been there and it was very, very impressive. And uh, I think I only went there once or twice. And I don't believe I saw half of it in the end because there are so many, uh, so many things to see and so much free food to eat. They were obviously samples of this and samples of that. And to a small boy, that was absolute paradise. Uh, so I, um, I did. Um, but later, uh, in, I forget the date, um, somewhere in 1936, I think it was. Um, suddenly, uh, my brother and sister, who were six and seven years older than I, and within their early teens, had a, were having a party at our apartment, which was on the fourth top floor of a, a, a block of flats. And suddenly somebody said, oh, look at that glow in the sky. And they looked, we looked out of the window, and there was this enormous red glow. 
and somebody somehow, it was certainly pre-computers or little things where you could do that. Anyway, somebody found out that it was a Crystal Palace was on fire. And so that uh, was rather a dramatic situation. And of course it just disappeared and we were left with just the towers and then independent television discovered that the location was absolutely magnificent, some antenna. <laughs> And that's when they built the Eiffel Tower or, or something similar. Hmm? That's when they built the Eiffel Tower or something similar to it. The Crystal yes. Palace, of course. Um, my joke with my daughter every time we go past it. Uh, <laughs> so you will have also, I'm sure, visited Horniman Gardens once or twice in your life? Horniman's was home from home for me on Saturday nights and Sunday nights. On Saturday, uh, I vividly remember Red Ray and the black and whites concert parties with, with comedians and jugglers and dancers and singers of varying competence. And then Sunday nights was band night for either military or light orchestral bands, as you see on the right there. And I learned a lot of very good music from both Saturday nights and Sunday nights. It was my early introduction to music, which became, apart from the radio, which of course one listened to a lot, but. Uh, and I would also go down and uh, sail a boat in, the, in the, the pond down at the foot of the hill. And um, I had another connection with Horniman's when uh, during the war they had a barrage balloon there, which was uh, where, the, where the pool is or where the pool was. And uh, there was a, a, a barrage balloon, which we sort of had an affection for because it was the local balloon. We lost our affection for it at the Wedge family when one night during, uh, there wasn't an air raid and we were asleep um, in the same room. We had a dugout sort of semi-basement room where we were sleeping. And suddenly there were flames galore outside the window. And we looked out and our pear tree was on fire. Now pear trees don't normally catch fire. So we were rather puzzled by that and went out to look and we went, we could see but what had happened was that our barrage balloon had been hit, been struck by lightning, hit the tree, <laughs> and uh, um, five or oh, ten minutes later, a bunch of very hysterical, with 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 amusement and laughter, uh, wafts arrived. It was their balloon, and uh, they'd followed the trail of the of the, of the wire that had suspended it, on which it had been suspended, and found it where it had landed, and. Uh, and he was struck by lightning, and uh, it was one of our more, more dramatic evenings during the war, I must say. That so, sounds a very unusual evening. Um, but Michael, just uh, one question that came in. Uh, Polly Watts, uh, I think, heard the Laundrette uh, uh, location at the corner of London Road and Dartmouth Road, wants to know if it was once a fish shop before then, where now Petters, the estate agent, is. Well, that I think was Trailings, T-I-A-Y-L-I-N-G-S. There was a fish shop, in fact, just on, at that corner. And that's indeed, yes, it was, there was a fish shop. Now, how the, the fish shop actually was, was next door to that. It was, it was where the Red Cross shop is now. It was oh, a, a, a wet fish shop called Cons. Um, and before it was Cons, it was actually Sainsbury's. Oh, ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can you can still see the Sainsbury's logo in in the floor as you go into the Red Cross shop. Um, but uh, as John says, it was definitely a fish shop uh, right up to the seventies. I think it's possible that there was a fish shop, uh, possibly in the area of the Laundrette before the Laundrette. The Laundrette uh, started up in about nineteen fifty two, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, th there is an article on the Forest Hill Society website about that laundrette. Uh, it was, for a time, the longest running laundrette. Um, not a single spin cycle, I should say, um, but it was the longest running laundrette uh, in, in London. Um, but, uh, you know, sadly, uh, uh, it, it closed or times move on or whatever. Um, but yes, there's, there's, there was, uh, as my mother has pointed out, there was definitely a fish shop uh, in, the, in the area that is now the Red Cross shop. Um, when, when we moved here in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, yeah, Pip, I want quick, to thank you very much. Just a quick um, quick thing, Michael, before we move on. Um, I imagine it is true because my father told me, but the reason that that laundrette 
has a curved front is it used to be a square building like all the others on the corners. Um, but the trams couldn't get round the corner. So the trams had to stop at Forest Hill. Then you got off, walked round the corner to pick up the next one to Catford. And to stop that. Yep. And again, I think this picture shows how the original yeah. curve looked uh, and how it had a load of load of that uh, curve taken off so that the trams could get round the corner. We even got a tram going round the corner. Uh, and also in that photo is the central platform of the station. Uh, so just four, four interesting pictures of the station. Um, but uh, I think we, we've segued very nicely um, from uh, Pip. And Pip, I want to thank you very much for your contributions. I think we'll be coming back to you, no doubt, later on for, for some more. But uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And, and John, uh, if we can uh, just turn to you. Um, now, one of the things that we were speaking about in our conversation was, was taking the train, and if it's okay, we'll pick up the train here, uh, because you used to get the train when you, uh, well, you still live in Forest Hill, but uh, yes. you used to take the train when you were a lot younger uh, and, and go down to the coast. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we, um, well, it was a, a rare treat for us when uh, my father would take us all down to the coast. I, I actually moved to Forest Hill. My parents moved to Forest Hill in 1949 when I was two. I was actually born in Highbury, but even then they couldn't, people couldn't afford houses in Islington, or ordinary people couldn't. So we built, built a little, or a little house on Chipman Road, um, which was just a um, tiny little house, outside toilet, no bathroom, and, you know, tin bath hanging on a book outside the back door. But to, Talk of the station on a rare treat, generally on a Sunday, we could get the train down to Brighton. And there was a central central platform there. And the entrance to the central platform um, was a, a set of stairs as you're coming through the, the subway from Perry Vale to Forest Hill Centre. So on the left-hand side, there was a, a set of stairs leading off from the subway up onto the platform. Um, and it used to be able to get fast trains from that platform to Brighton. I mean, not non-stop to Brighton, but they would only stop at you know one or two stations along the way. And uh, in the early days, they were the slam door um, carriages with steam engines. And so it was always a rush, particularly on a summer's day, when you're going down to the coast and somehow my parents seemed to have an uncanny knack or whatever it was of knowing where the tunnels were. So it was a, a, a rush to shut the windows as the train went into the tunnel or your carriage would fill up with smoke. Um, and then when it went out the other side, you could let them all back down again. But, and, and also when we were kids, what we, we used to for some reason like do was going up on the wooden bridge um, and waving at the trains as they came past. A lot of them were still steam trains. Um, waving at the trains as they came past and hoping that the, the driver would toot his horn at us before he smothered us in smoke. Um, I remember my mother getting quite upset on a number of occasions. My clothes were all smelly and, and quite horrible when I got home. Um, but somehow or other, that still never deterred us from doing it. <laughs> and the other, the other thing I really remember about Forest Hill when I was a young kid was, because as I was born in Highbury, we used to go up to Highbury to visit aunts and uncles and things quite regularly on a Sunday afternoon. I would always get the train from um, Forest Hill to London Bridge and then get a, a tram down Holloway Road. Um, but the thing that I always remember about Forest Hill is there always seemed to be big wicker basket, baskets there with homing pigeons in them, um, which presumably were being put on a train to somewhere or other where they'd be released. Um, because of course, just after the war, that, that actually was a, a big hobby of working men. And indeed, our next door, one neighbour had a pig in the um, Another guy down in Vestris Road had one. But there always seemed to be these baskets full of 
full of pigeons that were off somewhere. But, but another, and the other thing I, I really remember of my very young childhood was just the number of shops there were in Forest Hill that weren't in the middle of Forest Hill. I think almost every street had shops on it. So I lived on Shipman Road, and when when we were first there, there was a parade of shops opposite the top of Siddons Road, um, and there was um, oh, there was also some more on the corner of Vestris Road, and there was there was two grocers, two green grocers, a butcher's. For a short time, there was a fish and chip shop. Um, which became a haberdasher's. There was a sweet shop, um, and there was also um, what I really didn't like at the begin with the barbers. And you know, people think that you know doing your shopping online and getting it delivered is something new. But my mum every Thursday would take her book down to Martin's, the the grocer's near the top of Bestridge Road, just hand it in with her order. And a lad would come and deliver it in the, on his bicycle about two hours later. And it, you know, so there's nothing new under the sun, as they say. And um, it, there was lots of little trades and shops like that around with none of them are there now. I mean, they're all gone and it's just a bunch of houses. The other thing going on to, um, the Pip was saying about the bomb damage, well, just that, there was, there was also a lot of kids around that area at the time, all about the same age. Um, and the Normanton Street was one of the, the streets that was hit with the bombs that was on Michael's map. So virtually all of Normanton Street had gone. Um, most of the, the side of Siddons Road closest to Normanton Street had gone. So it's just a huge bomb site. Or to us, it was just a playground. And it, it was, you know, quite it was quite an amazing area, I remember when, when I was growing up. It's a it was a lots and lots of, of places like that around still that hadn't been, you know, obviously hadn't been built on at the time, which have all been used and built on now. But it it was a good place. And the, I mean the shops we used to rarely used to go up to the Forest Hill unless there was something special we wanted. But again, you know, saying about the, the fish shop at the same street, there was also another one up Dartford Road called Mac Fisheries. Um, but there was, you know, there was crazy shops up there. There was Home and Colonial and, and Gentlemen's Outfitters, remember, there was a few of those and stuff. But my favourite shop, which there were, there were two goslings around in those days. There was one up just past where Sainsbury is now. Um, and the other one was down on Perry Vale, um, on the, the Baptist church side of the road. And they always smelled wonderful because they always had coffee grinders in the windows. And it was, and I used to have to walk past the one on Perry Vale every day. Go to like Pip. I went to Adams Road Road um, for some reason or other, I don't know. And uh, it, so you used to have to walk past that every day. But again, the bottom of Siddons Road, you could get virtually everything you wanted down there in the week. So, you know, where the bistro is, there used to be a, a baker's that baked bread on the premises. Next door to it on Siddons was a um, was a little post office, and over the road you had another wet fish shop because there were lots, lots of them about, um, and another indicator of how times have changed. My mum used to used to buy turbot in there for the cat. The turbot was so plentiful it was cheap, um, and the price you pay for that now in Rick Stein's restaurant, it, you know, it was. Maybe there was also a cobbler's there back in the days when we always get our shoes mended. 
Um, and my mum used to go to the hairdressers on the corner for an occasional treat. And, um, and opposite that as well, where and they, at the bottom of Pearfield Road, where that, you know, I think that flats or something now in that, that big building, that used to be a shirt factory called Buckingham. Um, and next door to it was the laundry, which is still a laundry. Actually, it always has been. Um, there's the haberdashers so, there. It's there was a tons of shops around in Forest Hill that just were in the middle of Forest Hill. John, as oh, well as shops, we were we were discussing uh, pubs as well, and I've got mm. a picture of, of one of the pubs on the corner of Stansted Road and Westdale Road. Well, um, so spotted. Yeah. So mm. I suspect this is before your time, given that there's a horse out front. Uh, yes. So it looks like it was the early part of the 20th century. Mm. Um, I thought it was there for quite some time, wasn't it? It was. I can't remember exactly when it disappeared, but it, it I mean, it, it had been allegedly in a pretty sorry state for a while. I mean, um, the, the story, as I remember, is that it hadn't been built particularly well and really wasn't standing the test of time. Um, and it was either knock it down before it falls down type thing. But it, and that must have been, must have been late seventies, maybe in the eighties when that went. Yeah, but um, I think it must be the eighties because I definitely remember it, but only just about remember it being there. Uh, yeah. And now of course it's a, a block of flats, but it's, it's interesting from that photo Again, what you were saying about shops almost on every street, um, but this is Westdale Road, which has now got maybe one or two little takeaway shops. Uh, but it used to be, uh, you know, again, a major set of shops. And I think a cinema there as well. There was, there was the Astoria there on, on the next to the um, Salvation Army, which it was then, I don't know if it still is. Um, but yeah, there used to be shops all the way up to Ewart Road. I remember my sister took me to see Trapeze at the Astoria, which would have been well, probably in the mid 50s. I, and did, did you ever go to see a film at the Capitol in, in, in London Road? Well, I was an ABC minor when I was a child, which was the Saturday morning pictures. Well, there's sixpence downstairs and ninepence upstairs. The youngsters, that's old beddies. Um, which is what about tough and tape, two and a half new pits and four and a half. So, but yeah, we were there most Saturday mornings. Because, of course, back in those days, you, oh, by the time you're about six or seven, you just used to get thrown out of the house on, you know, Saturday morning. You're not expected back until tea time. It's, you know, your mother just wanted you gone out of the way. So it was, it was good. There were so many kids around that we could. Well, my father put it right the streets. So, so there's a couple of uh, interesting points that have come up in the chat. First of all, uh, Truda's, uh, Truda tells us that her grandmother used to play the piano in the cinema in the 1920s, <laughs> which is an incredible, you know, way back of, <laughs> and, and a connection to that one. Um, and uh, uh, yes, also there, there's a mention of the Forest Hill Breweries um, from Giles. Uh, now, my understanding is they used to brewery brewery. Was it was it on the site of the Foresters, the All in One, or was it just behind it? It was just behind it, I believe, and next door to it. Um, so I think it had an entrance up on Perry Vale. I don't actually remember it being there. I remember the building being there behind it still. Um, and there used to be a used to be a little road as well that went between. Um, Church Rise. Church Rise. What's it? Is it Clyde Vale? Go from Perry Vale down Park Hop Garage. No, that Clyde Vale was on the other side of the railway. Oh, right. There's so, Church, Church, Church Vale, which runs down the side Church of the Vale, Forest Yeah. So, so, so there's, there's a little road here. Church Vale and Hindsley's Place used to be a road ran across. That's it. I think I'm, I'm showing it on screen, maybe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. Uh, th there was the pub and the brewery on this lo in this location. Yeah, is that, that right? The 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 kind of working entrance of the brewery was on that little road. Right. Okay. Um, and a bit on where, a road called Chaplin Street. 
I have pictures of it. Oh, it's called I, Chaplin Street. Oh, yeah. Thanks. The sign, the sign said Clyde Vale, late Chaplin, Chaplin Street. I had a girlfriend who lived there. I, I remember seeing it. Clyde Vale, bracket, late Cap, Cap, Chaplin Street. Sorry, Dave, is that Chaplin Street or Chaplin Street? Chaplin, Chaplin, as in... Sure. Oh, as in Charlie. Yep. Okay, I didn't remember the name of it. Yeah. And, and John, am I right? I, I, I don't know if the dairy was still around uh, when you were in for you know, when, when you were growing up in Forest Hill. Is dairy still there at, the, in, at that location as well? Um, no, there's... Okay. There were a couple of dairies in Forest Hill, but I don't I don't remember that one because I from I, that one used to have a fairly grand entrance, I I think, although I don't actually really remember it. So I think Pip does remember it. So Pip, did you want to just come in there? What I was going to say was I don't um I think it was a dairy again after the war, but during the war it was West Lewis from B Division Heavy Rescue Depot. And that was where they had a maybe 10 large trucks and crews that would go out when there was a major bombing incident and probably people would, were caught under all kinds of rubble. Then a heavy rescue unit would go in and, and dig and, and uh, get people out. And that was in fact what that uh, was, that whole, what was it then later was United Dairies or perhaps before and then later. That's what it was all through the war up until, well, until I guess 44, 45, when it was, when it became whatever it did later, but uh, it served a very useful purpose during the war. Okay. The Thank brewery you. there, of course, was the, uh, the where Forrest Brown came from. Oh. The local beers. There is still an advert somewhere in Brixton. There is an advert on a wall for Forest Hill beer. Um, uh, I, I think I have put it on the website previously. And uh, the, the, the part about the milk, I think, Jason, you discovered something interesting about the milk churns turning up in Parliament. Not, not literally. Yeah, I, I found a, a great website that uh, allows you to search Hansard, uh, the official record of the House of Commons. Uh, so you can see when a first word or a phrase was and the first time Forest Hill was mentioned was the complaint that there were uh, milk uh, cans blocking the uh, exits and entrances to the trains on Forest Hill platform. So a wonderful way for Forest Hill to gain its notoriety in, in, our, in our democracy. Do you so, remember what year that was? You know, I, I'll find out for you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. I think it was. I, I think it was 1923, if I remember it, correctly. It, it was. It was certainly around then. Yes. Yeah. So, so sometimes there's problems with the station of milk uh, crates uh, blocking the access. At other times, as John pointed out, there were pigeons all over the place. Um, at other times, there's uh, uh, all sorts of things, bomb damage, as Pip has pointed out. Um, uh, and now we've got the car park there, which uh, is is a nuisance in its own right. Um, John, I want to thank you for your contribution. Again, we may come back to you for more memories, but I also want to move on, if that's okay, to Angela. Uh, Angela Finch uh, uh, is part of the uh, Finch dynasty uh, that has been uh, running shops in uh, Forest Hill for quite some time. I'm going to uh, just see if I can spotlight uh, you. Uh, uh, and, and, and just whilst you're doing that for, for John, it was February 23rd, 1926. Thank you. So, uh, Angela, I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the history of Finches uh, and uh, how it's come to be a, I mean, I assume it didn't start off as a ski hire shop in, no, in the <laughs> We keep evolving. Um, I, I only joined the family in 1983. Uh, I married Frank in 1983. I started working in the shop in 87 uh, when, I had our, when we had our first child. Um, but I've obviously been involved in the family for a long time and I've listened to grandfather Bill Finch tell all the stories and read. He, he, was, a, he was a great writer. So he documented an awful lot of things, um, family, little details, bits about Forest Hill. Um, but yeah, they, he, came down, um, he came down after the war. He was up in York, based up in York as a drill sergeant during the war and they had their first son, David, up there. And his family came from Shooter's Hill, 
so he had connections with South London um, and wanted to start a little business. I don't really know why he chose Forest Hill, but obviously the opportunity was there. And um, he started, he, he rented a little basement in number 25, Perry Vale, and uh, he had a barrow and he sold glass and books and bric-a-brac and all kinds of bits and pieces um, on what we regarded as a bomb site, which was opposite the, um, the subway in Forest Hill. So he started there and was quite successful with it and then bought number 25 Perry Vale. So they lived in, they had a kitchen and living room in the basement, they had the bedrooms upstairs and they had the shop in the middle. And uh, because there was lots of people didn't come back from the war, they, um, they ended up, you know, doing house clearances and auction houses. And obviously other new families had got together and they needed to build up all this secondhand furniture. They needed to, um, you know, furnish their houses. Um, so he did, he did very well to start with. He really enjoyed the business. Um, lots of people, when I moved into Forest Hill, um, you had lots of lovely big houses in Forest Hill and uh, people would point out these huge pieces of mahogany furniture and they'd say, bought that at Finch's. Um, but then obviously as, as time went on, people wanted more modern furniture and they wanted four mica worktops and none of this big heavy dark furniture. And, and also at this stage, my husband had turned up on the scene and he was a very keen footballer and everything to do with sports. And he basically said, I don't want to work in a dusty old furniture shop, dad. I, I want to, um, I want something to do with sports. Um, so his dad started him off with um, one little shop and let him sell his footballs and build up a little bit of a business there. And, um, and at one stage, Finches had, uh, they had a, they had a garden center, they had a Caligas shop, they had holiday hobbies, which had little, had kayaks, it had, you know, everything to do with, with holidays. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was expanding and expanding. And then Frank started to take over more and more bits of the shop for sports. Um, and that went on for quite a long time until back in, I think I'll put the date down somewhere, um, in the, uh, when, when sports shops, every high street had a sports shop. So Sydenham High Street had a really good sports shop. They were nearly all owned by families. Um, so they, they, then you had um, Olympic sports started coming into London and basically put all of these little shops out of business. Um, I must actually go back. I've skipped a little bit here because I've skipped the um, the removal side of the business. So way back when the when they were doing house clearances, um, they had to buy a lorry to do the house clearances, and then that sort of grew into removal business, and that became very famous. You can see the, the picture up there about Finches up at Buckingham Palace. Um, there's another picture of one of their lorries in front of Ten Downing Street. So they were probably one of the biggest removal companies in London at one point. Um, so the, the, the removal part of the business that grew sustainably. The sports shop seemed to take over from the, um, from the furniture as the furniture was waning. Um, and then Olympus Sports came along and got rid of it sort of more or less put most sports shops out of business. So we had at this stage got a quite a good little sports um, department in the ski shop. So that's basically how we survived. We turned to skiing instead of general sports. Um, so people, we're now the only independent ski shop in London, the whole of London. Um, and then the bicycle side, that came about about 15 years ago because the skiing was so successful in the winter that we had no summer trade. So the obvious thing was cycling, mountain biking, you know, same kind of thing really. So yeah, that's, that's more or less the story of Finches.
Um, and the latest little addition is our daughter. Our son is more or less taking over this shop and our daughter has started a tattoo and piercing studio beside us in, in Perry Vale and in a little corridor beside number 25. So we're all still here, second generation, third generation of Finches, all in the same spot in Perry Vale. Thank you very I think much. That's it, Michael. Um, well, th th one other thing is the, the photos that you very kindly oh. sent me, and I think these yeah. are on the wall in the shop, is that right? They're not, I have them, I have them not framed at the moment, but I have them available in the shop. Okay, so, so this is Perry Vale. Uh, we think probably in the 1960s, we're, I, I'm happy to be corrected on that by people who were here in the 1960s, but we've got that, uh, 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 we've got the panorama uh, of the shops going up, uh, and I think one particular point that I would point out is the Glenlyn Ballroom, um, which is now the JK Ballroom, I think, with the uh, beautiful golden fronted uh, house where VJ's Cafe uh, used to be. Um, and I mean, I think it tells so much of a story here. Apart from anything else, there's no cars parked on the street. But uh, uh, I, I was drawn to the frozen food specialists, which I think is very advanced for the time. Um, uh, you know, cooked, cooked meat, frozen meat, but we can also just go down the road a little further. Um, and uh, we, we, so this is around the corner uh, on, on Perry Vale. Uh, we can see the uh, Foresters uh, pub here, the all-in-one. Um, we can also see the, the yard here that was used for removals, but I think you were saying it wasn't uh, this was prior to the removals business, is that yeah, right, Andrew? Are. Yeah, that, that was actually, uh, well, it was called the Armoury. So back in history, I believe it was some kind of arms storage area. Obviously before it is what it is there. So in the wartime, I think it was some kind of arms storage. Uh, and I, I remember there was a small, it was called the cabin. Uh, it was a little hut. Uh, just across from the underpass, uh, which sold sweets, blackjacks for a penny and all the rest of it on the way to school. Um, uh, and I think in this photo, we can also see finches, although there's, there's a bit of a glare on here, but we, we can see finches down here in the corner. Um, and I think uh, from what you were saying, there's been a, the, the finches site has moved between different shops here. Is, is that right? Well, it's basically, it's, um, it was the, we, we, we had the three shops. So, the number 25 was the one your cursor is on there. And then 27 is where our main shop entrance is now. And we also had number 29. And Mr. Finch ended up living up above number 29 for about 30 years of his life. Always wanted to be on top of the business. Very good. My, Michael, I just wanted to say lots of people thanking Angela, Pip, and uh, oh. Don already for their contributions. And your mother is reminding you that Finches did your removal in 1978. Yeah. I know. I know that. <laughs> Angela. Yeah. Uh, very interesting uh, tale about the recent uh, burglary in your, in your store. Oh, yes. It was... Would you like to tell everybody about what happened there? Yeah, it was... Uh, um... Oh, uh, somebody came along and basically jammied the front of the, our grids, which we always felt very, very secure. We're all alarmed up. We live upstairs, so we're very much on top of the business still. Um, and at two o'clock in the morning, the, um, the, we heard this big crash. So somebody had opened, basically peeled the shutter away from the front of the shop, broke a panel of glass, snatched this 8,000 pound bike out of the window um, and disappeared. Rode off with it all in, in a, within, within about three minutes, he'd broken in and rode away with a bike. So we rushed down, police arrived. And um, the next day we, because we, it was an electric bike, an electric, very, very distinctive mountain bike, um, we contacted the, our supplier and to say if anybody is trying to get a battery charger for this electric bike, you know it's our bike. So grab them basically. And, uh, and they said, you realize that bike's got a tracker on it. So we 
uh, registered the, the bike, the tracker, and we found that the bike was sitting in a block of flats over in Tower Hamlets. So we contacted the police, they got a unit over there straight away. My son went over as well. And, uh, and they sort of stood outside this block of flats for about 20 minutes to an hour, I think, no movement. And all of a sudden, as they were about to leave, there was this sudden thing came up on my son's phone saying, Foxy, which was the name of the bike, we'd named it, Foxy has had a crash because they'd taken it out of the block of flats and thrown it in the back of a van and then it started moving. So the police car was chasing what they thought was an electric bike all day through the streets of London. It was actually in the back of a van and they ended up catching it, recovering it. It wasn't actually the thief, but the receiver that they, they arrested, but we got our bike back and we got a third page, page news headlines in the um, South London press. So it was all well, and we sold it the next day. Somebody was actually looking for that bike and he happened to be the right size and he bought it next day, the day after we recovered it. So all's well that ends well. That really put you on the map. It did, it did. Every, you know, uh, people actually tend to forget about businesses in Perry Vale sometimes. And, you know, little businesses that have been there the whole time, people do forget about. They go off shopping in big shopping centres. So every little thing that brings attention to your business is fantastic. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, John, I just wanted to come back to you because we mentioned the Glenlyn Ballroom. Um, and uh, am I right in saying that you saw concerts there? Um, I, I'm not sure, yes. John. Yeah, 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 you are there. Sorry. Oh, yeah, we can hear Sorry. you. <laughs> yes, I, when I was, you know, very well, probably late teens, early 20s, it used to be very much a an in place for people to go. Um, and they had some remarkable bands there that you just, you can't believe up and coming bands these days would ever play a place like the Glen. Um, as Mike, you know, as a number of you know, and Michael put the picture up, and it's just a door between two shops. And behind that door is a long corridor to the right to the back of the shop. And then there's like a big, hall out the back, um, which I guess is still there and is being used for the weddings and whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think they're you know, probably the, well, the most pertinent plate of fame was that the Who were the resident band there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, when they were, just, they, they flicked around when they were both the Who and the High Nuts. Uh, because they started life as the Who, then became the high number, and then went back to being the Who. Um, but they also had, uh, and the Beatles have played there, Mersey Beats, Ollie's, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Rolling Stone played there. They had a large number of bands playing there. I mean, obviously, before they were, were mega famous and could fill stadiums. Um, but there were some, some fabulous times. Absolutely fabulous times there. Um, you know, and it could get a little rough now and again, but it was, uh, I, I just remember some great times there. Thank you. Uh, I think it's amazing some of those names from the 60s, uh, you know, some mm -hmm. of the biggest bands uh, in, in, in the world yeah. uh, play, played, uh, you know, very, very local, just a, a relatively small venue. Uh, Absolutely. Down, down I mean, now that so I miss one off the list, that's all the Yardbirds there as well. And of course, the Yardbirds, although in themselves were particularly famous, they became incredibly famous just for the people who played with them. You know, guys like Clapton and, and you know, Rick Greck and, and you know, a number of other incredibly famous musicians um, started life with the Yardbirds. Thank Matt, you very can, much. I, can I ask you how much did it cost to go in? Hey, well, um, from from memory, it was only something like half a crown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, if they, if they had a big band on, it was probably five shillings or something. It oh. was, Thank you. Know, you. It, it really wasn't very much money at all. Um, but I, I did see, um, I, I might still have it actually. It got given by the who, the, one of their invoices for playing there. And they only got paid three pounds <laughs> for, for a night's work there. Well, it might have been three pounds ten, but it was a very tidy sum of money. Interesting. <laughs> but it was of the time, and that was that really was our band became known back then. Obviously, there weren't you know the uh, the social media channels to get known through, and mm -hmm. the only way you made money was if people bought your records. Know, preferably in that nice little record shop on Dartmouth Road, opposite. Well, about opposite. I think it's now the now the tanning salon opposite the the, the Sylvan Post. Well, there, there is still a uh, record shop on Dartmouth Road now, the Leaf and Groove, uh, mm -hmm. selling books and records, actual records, yeah. vinyl, yeah. Uh, and and that's supporting the the local library. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, if anybody is still has a record player, uh, then that, that's the place to go for some uh, right. records. It's the, the in thing I understand now, Michael. Vinyl back. Actually, Apparently so. Sorry, if I just mentioned that uh, we have a new shop in For Forest Hill called in Perry Vale called the Pantry, and they actually have a record player on their counter, and they play vinyls in the pantry. Oh, lovely! Is that that's the one. That um, on the on the corner, isn't it? On yeah. where the uh, the failed fish and grocery shop was. Exactly. It used to be yeah. a pet shop way back. Absolutely. I yeah. bought my first ever goldfish in that shop. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I I would like to thank all three of the panelists for all of the contributions so far. We're not finished yet. Uh, there's uh, a number of questions that have come in. One of the interesting questions, and I think Pip, it's really addressed to you, uh, is uh, a pre-war question about Manor Mount in particular. So, uh, Pip, I, I don't know if you're um, uh, if, if you've heard the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the, the German church uh, uh, which is on Dakers Road uh, is now uh, named after Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but he was actually there in the pre-war uh, church that was there. Um, which was bombed by the Nazis, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer was an, an anti-Nazi German uh, and he lived at the top of Manor Mount. And, and I'm told that there may have also been a German school uh, on Manor Mount. Yes, there was. And in fact, um, uh, in the block of flats where we lived, uh, our next door neighbors, the same on, at the top, had, um, were a German Swiss family and a couple of their kids actually went to the German school. Uh, so I was familiar with it, though I didn't attend it. Or I don't think I even, may have gone to a concert there or some kind. But uh, yes, I was aware of the, of the, of the school up there. Uh, some nice houses up that road. And uh, uh, I, used to, <laughs> I used to run the fire, fire watchers group. And I had a roster of everybody on the street and everybody had, when we started having the, the, the blitz and all the fires, they started uh, getting every street to organize itself to deal with them so that someone had a responsibility of staying awake and having a stirrup pump and a bucket of water by their knees and ready to go charging out anytime incendiary bombs dropped in the street because uh, uh, there wasn't as much attention being paid early enough to deal with those the bombs, they were only a couple of two kilo things, but they could sure start a fire unless they were attended to pretty quickly with both spray of water and sand. So I had a list of everybody on the street and I had to check on them and make sure they were doing the job. You know, you'll be on Tuesday night and you'll be on Wednesday night and so on. And it was an interesting exercise. I think that's, Man Amount was, uh, had all kinds of history going for it. Uh, and one thing that we haven't mentioned uh, in the history of Forest Hill is we've talked a bit about Forest Hill Station. What we haven't talked about is Lordship Lane Station. Uh, and I just wanted to share my screen. 
because uh, I've got a few photos from Lordship Lane Station that may interest people. So Lordship Lane Station, actually, I've got a map. If I can uh, get to the map, uh, let me just see if I can bring that up. Uh, it's a bit odd the way things open up. Lordship Lane Station uh, is uh, on the uh, just on the other side of the South Circular from Hornham and Gardens. Uh, it's now uh, a housing estate, um, which leads up to uh, the woods. Um, but it used to be a station. It used to be the train line that went along uh, what is now the Nature Trail. It went up to Nunhead uh, in the north and it went to Crystal Palace High Level Station. Uh, that's on effectively on Crystal Palace Parade with the subway going underneath to get to the park. Um, and uh, I just happened, to, I, I, I found a few photos from Lordship Lane, a tram that looks like it's too big to get under that bridge. Um, but uh, uh, that's looking down the hill down towards Lordship Lane with Sydenham Hill on the left hand side. And I think that's the train station building on the left. Um, the train station, if I can bring it up, was apparently quite an impressive building. Um, Pip, I don't know if you remember this at all, but uh, it was it apparently Dulwich College, insist, uh, who, who owned the land, insisted that it was a fairly spectacular building and the bridges as well. Um, uh, but so, so this was Lordship Lane Station. Uh, uh, not, not so exciting, admittedly, from the platform, um, which, which looks a bit more like that. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's a bit small. Um, but hopefully you can see that uh, just... Uh, I'm, uh, and uh, I just got one or two more photos of this. Uh, this, is, this is actually, by the looks of it, the bridge being removed uh, from... Uh, from the uh, roadway there. And uh, I believe that is next to Lordship Lane Station. So uh, uh, just taking that uh, bridge away. Uh, the final photo I've got is not really a photo at all. It's a painting. This is the very famous Pizarro painting taken from the bridge at Cox's Walk, looking down towards Lordship Lane Station, which is the building here. Uh, and this continues on uh, down the bottom of the hill. This is the Horneman Hill. Um, with a, just a few houses on it, um, but looking up to, to, towards uh, towards Honor Oak, uh, uh, and which had its own station, Honor Oak, rather than Honor Oak Park. Um, so, uh, Pip, uh, I, I don't know if you wanted to say anything further about Lordship Lane Station. Uh, I, uh, I was uh, a bit small when I was using ornaments. I was... Uh, I didn't ever get over to the other side of the road, and I do not recall seeing that building. I must confess, I'm quite impressed to see it, but I really don't recall having seen it before, and I never had reason to travel either to or from the station. I was obviously aware of it, and its route to Honor Oak and Nunhead and all the places it went to, or because that was part of like interest, being interested in bus routes and tram routes. I was interested in train routes as well, but I never actually traveled from that station. So I couldn't offer anything. I used to go past it regularly. We used to go to Highwood Barracks, which was just past the station. If you went up, going to Lordship Lane towards Dulwich and Highwood Barracks was there. And that's where we would go to Saturday night dances. Uh, comes out it's often punctuated by enormous crashes of sound as, as they, this whole mass of rockets they had a barrage of rockets in the uh, in the hills behind uh, or just beyond your Lordship Lane station and behind the barrack and they used to let off these rockets which never I don't think it hit anything but they certainly impressed the residents with what was being done and uh, it interrupted the dancing rather well but um, <laughs> other than that I had no real knowledge of Lordship Lane station I'm afraid. Okay no no that, that's can fine. I, um, sorry, can I just say you Mark, Michael I can say that when I when I was a young child, that train was still running along those, along that line. Um, I think it must have stopped running in the very late 50s, that very early 60s. Um, but Sydney Hill Station, uh, sorry, Lordship Lane Station was still there um, and not particularly well protected from the wood side. So from the bridge over Coxie's Walk, and down onto the now disused railway and go and play in the station. So it's 
in which we, we did from time to time. It did allegedly have a caretaker, but he frequently wasn't there. So it was... <laughs> Very good. So, um, I, 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 again, thank you for, for all of the memories and remin reminiscences. I do want to just allow people to have, have a general chat. Uh, and if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask, um, you know, please, please do just come on the line and ask them. Uh, anybody want to kick off with any questions? Well, Michael, there were some questions that uh, people had posed in the in the chat room that uh, I could revisit here. Um, I think Tony Brown uh, was born in the Hermitage off Westward Park in Honor Grove Park in 1949, and uh, wondered if anybody knew when when it was pulled down. And uh, Simon Caldwell, uh, her uncle's father, owned Walters Precision Woodwork. Uh, which I think is in the site, which is now the new Sainsbury's, not the old one that was aforementioned. And if anybody has any recollections of, of Walter's precision woodwork. <laughs> Sadly not. No. It's bringing to mind at the moment. Sorry, Tony. Sorry, Sonia. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe look into that a little bit further. I'd like to know if anyone has any recollections of Trinity um, Methodist Church in Perry Vale, um, just the other side of Church Vale where the uh, St George's School now is. Uh, and more interestingly, if anyone has a picture, because I only have a very distant picture of it. Well, I, I... I missed that. Wait, what was the question? Uh, sorry, John. I just wanted to know um, if if you have any recollection of the Trinity Methodist Church in Perry Vale, um, just a bit further down from where the brewery was, um, just the other side of Church Vale. Uh, I think it suffered some bomb damage, so it would have been around uh, during the war and a little while afterwards. Um, and also, if anyone had a picture of it, I'd be really interested no. because uh, um, I've only ever managed to source one very distant one. Yeah, so I, I, I don't have a photo of it, but we, yeah. we've certainly got it on the map here, mm -hmm. uh, right next to Church Vale, uh, which actually might be why it's called Church Vale. I've always associated with it with the church at the top of the hill. Um, but uh, it actually makes more sense to be the church on Church Vale, uh, where there is now the St George's Primary School, uh, and I assume that that uh, the, 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 the some of that church land became that primary school. Mm. From, from what I can make out, it was a very impressive building, and it, it came down some time after the war. I do have a photo of a different church, uh, which was on the corner of Derby Hill. Uh, and Dartmouth Road. So this is where Heron House used to be, is now. Um, but this is uh, another, I, I think, Methodist Hall uh, on on uh, Derby Hill. And um, Pip, you remember that one? That's that's the Sydenham Baptist Church. It was in Forest Hill, but it was the Sydenham Baptist Church. I mentioned it earlier. It was one of the six churches that formed our youth club, and uh, some of our early meetings were. In fact, I was a member of the Sydenham Baptist Youth Club. In, uh, in about 1942, and uh, then it became part of the Fawcett uh, Youth Club, and uh, my best friend was married there, and uh, we used to use their church hall a lot for meetings, and I've got quite a few photos of, of members of this club that's uh, taken in, in the Sydney Baptist Church, church Hall. Uh, and I should point out that the image on the left-hand side isn't the Baptist Hall. Uh, uh, it's it's the swimming baths. It's the um, first-class swimming baths, uh, possibly quite late in its life before you know it's been drained of water um, and uh, before it was demolished. Uh, but you know there there were the two pools in in the previous swimming baths that was there until uh, 2006 or so. Um, this was the first class pool. It, it, 
not not until 2006, but uh, back back in time when it was built, uh, this was the first class pool, and the uh, second class pool was built afterwards uh, next to it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure most people who lived in Forest Hill remember going swimming there at some point, I would hope. My aunt paid for me to have swimming lessons there when I was four, so I remember it well. There were, also, was... there were also old slipper baths, do you remember? Yes. Yeah, Which were public they were. baths. They were, they were public baths, weren't they? Yes, because oh, right, a lot yeah. of our house, an awful lot of houses, just didn't have a bathroom. So people used to go there for their weekly bath. I believe they were called slipper baths because you had to wear slippers in them. You couldn't oh, have right. bare feet. Michael, I was initially very confused by that slide because I thought they'd converted the church into a swing bath. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. It was but, just me but, throwing a load of pictures here. But, but seriously, so first class and second class means like you pay more to go in the one pool than the other pool or what? Yeah. Yes. The, the, the other thing that used to take place in the swimming baths is uh, public meetings, which sounds a little bit odd. Um, but what they did is I believe they boarded over the swimming uh, pool. I think it was particularly in the winter time where they didn't uh, necessarily heat the water to such a height. Anyway, so that they boarded it over. I think uh, Clement Attlee famously spoke in the swimming pool uh, in Forest Hill. Um, but I think public meetings were a fairly regular occurrence in, in the swimming pool. And dancers, night dancers as well. I was going to say it was quite common for uh, for in, in Victorian times that the swimming pools had a dual purpose with covers to be used for other public meetings, even Earl's Court. Uh, strangely enough, in uh, in uh, West London, now now torn down, uh, actually had swimming uh, swimming pools underneath the exhibition floor. Could I ask hey. Pip a question? Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, Tim Bradley. Uh, we're Johnny Come Lately's moved here, nineteen ninety nine, uh, but we had a neighbour uh, down on Benson Road who. Uh, was born and grew up there during the 20s and 30s on Benson Road. And he remembered climbing over the wall to what became the Tewkesbury Estate to go apple scrump in um, on the lands above there. How, how were you there before the Tewkesbury Estate was built? And how was it at the top of the um, hill? Well, there was a, a big area that was wide open. Uh, behind us, there were some new houses on, uh, oh God, what's the name of the, the Crescent? The, the, um, the post office, sorting office used to be on Devon Devonshire Road. Road. And then there was this Crescent. Wood, Wood, Woodcombe, Woodcombe, Woodcombe Crescent. What's that? Yeah. Woodcombe Crescent. Was it? Um, doesn't Woodcombe anyway. Crescent leads up to U Elm Road. There were new houses there, but there was still a lot of grass up further up. There was a guy named Pierce who had Pierce's yard, which is a builder's yard, which was just at the bottom of Manor Mount, where it meets David's Road. And they, he had a team of beautiful uh, wagon, horses and wagons to cart sand and bricks and stuff around. And the, the excitement of the year was when they were painted with lovely red and white markings on the wheels in the spring. Um, but he had, a, he had a very big house. Mr. Pierce that he built just up a man amount from from us and there was a road that was built along to it which was otherwise this very grassy area so I assume that sort of area beyond his house and whatever land he took for himself um, was where they would go scrumping or whatever it was they were doing I never went around there but never went around the back there but uh, it was certainly an area I was aware of Thank you very much, and also for very interesting presentations. Can I ask a quick question? So on, on your maps, um, I, I haven't moved to Forest Hill yet. I am moving there. I'm moving to the top of Sydenham Hill. And I see lots of huge, lots of, lots of open land on, on your earlier maps and a very few number of houses. On, on the sort of going up the hill. But now it's all sort of 1950s, 60s council, former council estates. 
So what what happened to the houses? Were were they bombed out or well it's got Queen's Road and then uh all around there. There's just just huge gardens and a few houses. So where are we talking were they, about? Were they sold after the war inheritance taxes or so I think uh, it, yeah. it varies. So there was certainly a lot of bombing that removed a number of houses uh, from the area. Uh, in terms of Queen's Road or Tame Out Rise, as it's now known, uh, which, which is where I live, uh, there were a number of very large uh, properties at the top of the hill. Um, Tame Out Lodge was there, which is now Tame Out Grange. Um, uh, and there were a number of others, uh, plots of, of land, I might even have an earlier map than this, uh, going back to the 19th century, but this is 1952 uh, map. Um, and so some of those houses were bombed, some of them uh, just became derelict, uh, others would just have been, uh, you know, people selling them, turning them into uh, uh, large groups of houses and making more money out of it. Um, C certainly, I know there were a number of bungalows around uh, the, the first side of the roundabout at the top of Tame Out Rise when I came here in 1978. Each of them, in turn, has been uh, removed and replaced by uh, uh, blocks of flats. Uh, so I, I think, you know, that that's probably the story of a lot of bits of London that large houses get removed and replaced by uh, large numbers of houses, blocks of flats and things like that. We can still see it happening today. Uh, uh, Castle Bar up on Sydenham Hill, a maze house, uh, which hasn't been maze house for a little while, but you know, these are again, huge uh, buildings. Sorry, I've gone onto the wrong slide, but uh, th those were huge uh, houses that were in the area uh, that, that got removed. Similarly, you know, we see up Elliott Bank. Uh, Elliott Bank is now uh, a number of large uh, blocks of flats. It used to be a terrace, uh, a street, uh, and similarly, Sydenham Rise, which again is 1960s housing, used to be a street with uh, houses along it. Uh, I mean, we can look at the bomb damage. There was a, a fair amount of damage around the area, but there was also plenty of houses that continued to be there after the war uh, uh, and gradually things change. Um, okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions that they wanted to ask or any memories to share? Mark, I, I just have one bit of uh, snippet of information because it just reminded me when you were showing the, uh, uh, the Baptist uh, chapel uh, on Dartmouth Road, that the rector there, uh, Minister, was also the rector of um, Tudor Hall, the school uh, which existed in um, uh, in South Road, opposite Christchurch, um, for oh, ever since the 1850s. So um, um, he was already uh, the rector of the, of, of, of the school um, uh, before that church was even built. So there's a very interesting history to follow up on there if anyone uh, wants to. Uh, I, that information is sort of available and on the, the school still exists up in Hertfordshire somewhere, I believe. So you can get it from the school's website. I remember uh, Woolworth in uh, in Forest Hill. Um, I'm sure everybody else who was here in the 70s remembers Woolworth. I don't know how long it had been there. Uh, there used to, there was, when Woolworths existed, there was one in every district. And this was a particularly large and a particularly good one. I remember you buying clothes there and pots and pans and records and everything you wanted you could get in Woolworth uh, but I don't know does anybody know when it's when it's arrived I can tell you that it was certainly there by about 1933 when I was big enough to be able to look over the counter rather than look up from under the counter when my mum took me in there and my mother always knew exactly what she was getting for Christmas because there was a thing at the end 
of a counter, which was Christmas presents. Now it was definitely a thruppence and sixpence store at the time. And uh, there were some more expensive things, but the large majority of stuff, it was the thruppence and sixpence store. And I was aware of it from the age of five. So it would have certainly been there in uh, 1933, but I don't, I do not know and recall exactly when it would have opened, I'm afraid. Where, where was it situated? Where in Forest Hill was it? Sorry? Where in Forest Hill was this Woolworths? In, it was in London Road. Um, it's, it now called, it's, it's now called Energy Gym. Uh, oh, really? So, yeah, I was, I was checking it out. So I, I thought for a while it was where, um, uh, I, I thought it was slightly dif different location, but yes, it, it's where Energy Gym is now. Uh, which I, I, I know which one I'd prefer to have. Yeah. Yeah. I think in its time it's been uh, McDonald's, it's been Woolworths. Oh, I remember that. May have even yeah. been KFC, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, yeah, at the moment it's a gym, which uh, I, I don't know, all this health and stuff. Greenfields, the grocers, the, the green grocers was next door. I know. And that was where you couldn't choose the tomatoes or the potatoes or the apples you wanted. You said you'd have a pound of tomatoes and they would give you the tomatoes and put them in a bag. You didn't have the pleasure of a supermarket and be able to select that one and that one and that one. There, there was a, a shoe shop of Freeman Hardy Willis in Dartmouth ah. Road when oh, we yeah, first well. moved in. Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, that, that, that I think there's possibly still a sign. Is it for Freeman Hardy Willis or is it for Jewhurst? As you go into Bonner Pizza, um, there's definitely some tiling on the floor. Uh, for, for something, uh, I, I, but I that think Freeman would Hardy be Willis, that would be Dewhurst, which was a butcher. Yeah, but I um, think Freeman Hardy Willis moved from one place to another at one point as well, so it gets a bit more confusing, uh, just, just to help out. I do remember when there was a great variety of shops in Dartmouth Road when I first moved here, which is more than 40 years ago now, and there was a specialist chocolate shop which we delighted in going to, as well as an art shop and photographers and incredible use, useful things like that, which just disappeared. Oh, even no, the there was a lovely, was a lovely little boutique called Tilt. Oh yes, they, they 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 live across the road from me, Annie and Nathan, who used to run that little boutique. <laughs> Angela remembers it. It was a lovely little. I like them, yeah, good people. <laughs> Is it, does anybody, is anybody old enough to remember a shop on uh, Perry Vale? It was probably quite near, uh, Angela, your, where you were. Were you 25 Perry Vale? Is that right? Something we're 25, like that. 20, yeah. 20, um, no. Somewhere on that side around there was a place, a shop, H.L. Daniel. He was a rider in the TT races and he yeah. was a motorbike store and he was sort of he was our local celebrity i don't think we had anybody else in those days but he was the celebrity he used to he won at the tt races in the isle of man on occasion he had a lovely store just about 50 25 around that sort of number perry vale uh, my father's company driscoll's had tobacconists at 39 perry vale further up which was later bombed and at number four perry vale uh, this I just found I just found something out about it. I'll post it in the chat window. Oh, great! Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, there was another motorcycle shop here on the, on Dartmouth Road, which was which was run by John Surtees' father. Oh, that's so right. John yes. Surtees, the only man who's ever won the world title on both four wheels and two. Oh, yeah. um, his father ran the motorcycle shop, um, which is now. Um, the the shop I believe is is the um, the hair the hairdressers called Gina or something like that, mm -hmm. um, which is you know up on the left hand side opposite Kingsway House. The the other place that's uh, possibly worth a mention is the Turkish Delight Factory that used to exist oh, uh, behind behind Kemble Road. Uh, so. 
uh, John, do you remember that one? I do. It was at just from Shipman Road where I live. The, the end of Shipman Road is Trilby Road. And the Ling's Turkish Delight Factory was just at the bottom of Trilby Road. And, you know, it used to, uh, was, there was quite a smell down there. The number of local ladies who worked there making the chocolate delight. And they used to, used to sell it in little round tubs, wooden, like little round wooden tubs. But it's, it was there for years and years and years. It's now houses, of course. Yes. So um, we're, we're just hitting nine o'clock uh, and uh, we've had one and a half hours. So I think if it's okay, I'm going to draw it to a, con to a close, to a conclusion. Um, I want to thank everybody who came along this evening. I particularly want to thank Pitt, John and Angela for sharing their memories uh, and uh, uh, reminiscences of, of Forest Hill. I think it's been absolutely incredible to hear from the three of you uh, and to hear from everybody else as well. Uh, so, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, I also want to share just a couple of links. The first one is a map uh, uh, linked to some maps. It's a great resource that I found, which is oldmapsonline.org that I've just posted up in the chat window. Uh, it has maps going back quite some time uh, and is a uh, huge, uh, you know, just really good for, for looking at some of the maps that we've seen today. Um, uh, and um, before we finish for the evening, I just want to hand over to Klaus, if I may. Uh, if you are available uh, and would like to say a word or two. I am Ready? available. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, obviously I, I need to say thank you very much to Michael. Um, he's, I know he's literally been organising this for months, researching it, getting all the people on board and everything like that. So a huge virtual round of applause to Michael for organising it. Um, and also, you know, I wanted to echo Michael's thanks to all the, uh, the panellists. I mean, Pip, fantastic that you have these memories that sounds like it was like yesterday that you remember it. It's just brilliant. I mean, all the stuff about doodle bugs, the, you know, the, the bit about the church and the choir and the youth clubs. I mean, I, I loved all of that. Um, you know, John as well. I mean, some amazing memories of all the the local businesses and the way you sort of remember exactly which one was where, when. Um, you know, it was really interesting to find out there were shops all over the place in Forest Hill. Shirt manufacturer would be useful uh, as we start going back to work. I mean, unfortunately we've lost all of that stuff. And, and I mean, it's so cool that the Rolling Stones played here as well. I love that too. Um, Angela, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for keeping that shop open during lockdown. It's been, uh, you know, a really valuable resource for those of us who cycle around town. I know my son's been in a few times for some random emergency bike fixes. Thank you very much for that. Love those pictures of the van outside Buckingham Palace. <laughs> I had no idea you were the biggest independent ski shop in London. And, um, and the fact that the family is doing tattoos now, I'm sure Michael and Jason will be down there like a shot now. I'm uh, first in the queue. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, in fact, I'll pay for it, Michael, if you get a tattoo. Um, yeah. And I'm very happy to learn that vinyl is back as well. That was one of my other favourite takeaways. So I'm a big fan too. So again, like massive thank you to everyone, uh, and thank you for everyone for coming. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Mm -hmm.